Hello everyone, my name is Nick Zolman, and it's my pleasure to be here today to talk to you about our recent work on creating interpretable and efficient reinforcement learning methods with sparse dictionary learning. If you're interested in learning more about this work, uh, you can find our recent paper on the, uh, on the archive, and all of our code is available on GitHub at this repository. So be sure to check those out. At a very high level, I'm going to be describing how we can use sparse dictionary learning methods to fit interpretable representations of these three major components of reinforcement learning. In particular, I'm going to show how we can fit lightweight surrogate models for the environment and the reward functions so we can rapidly accumulate experience and bypass the expensive interactions of a full order model, whether that is a physical system or a simulation. I will also be talking about how once we have a deep neural network policy, we can actually use dictionary learning to extract a symbolic or interpretable representation of that policy. And finally, whether we use all of these methods together or independently, we can actually perform uncertain quantification. And this will act as a tool for us to inspect these learned models and identify any data gaps uh, where we want to collect more information. So let's get started. What is reinforcement learning? Well, quite simply, it can be described as learning through interaction. And this is not a new concept. It's existed uh, probably over a century now in the context of human and animal behavioral psychology. But every reinforcement learning method has these three major components. Uh, there is the agent, and this is the decision maker. It's what's actually interacting in response to observations. And there's the environment. This is some dynamic process that changes in response to those uh, actions. And there's the reward. Uh, this is the learning signal. And the idea is that by providing these incremental rewards, such as treats to this chicken, we can start to encourage or incentivize particular behaviors to perform tasks. And maybe those tasks become very complicated. But by repeated interaction uh, with the environment, the agent will start to associate those behaviors with the rewards and perform the desired uh, capability. And all these concepts have direct analogies to modern machine learning and engineering. Uh, the agent, instead of being a chicken, might be a deep neural network. It's still going to be producing actions that will execute into an environment, um, which is now governed by some dynamical system, such as a PDE. And it will be interacting with these rewards that are not treats, but instead some scalar valued function, uh, which indicates how well the agent is doing. So perhaps we want to minimize drag and we provide sort of the negative drag uh, as an incremental reward. And deep reinforcement learning has gone off to do some really amazing things over the last decade, uh, from beating professionals in different games to uh, stabilizing plasma configurations and a tokamak reactor to actually performing novel scientific discovery. But there are drawbacks to deep reinforcement learning. In particular, uh, these methods require many, many interactions with an environment, perhaps even millions or billions. And uh, this can be a very expensive process, not just in terms of time, but in terms of actual dollars or money, right? Uh, if you have a laboratory setup such as a wind tunnel and you're repeatedly interacting with that, turning the experiment on and off and monitoring it, that has a real physical cost to it. And you may try and bypass all this by doing everything in simulation, but there are computational costs too. If you run these high fidelity computational fluid dynamics solvers, for instance, uh, this is a non-trivial expense, both in terms of uh, actual computational resource, but an energy too. And that energy has a non-trivial um, effect on the environment that we actually live in. Uh, so we have to keep that in mind too, and we cannot neglect that. So this is all to say the deep reinforcement learning has a sample efficiency problem. But it also has an interpretability problem. It relies on deep neural networks, which are very good approximators for uh, some input-output relationships, um, but they're very hard to in inspect the internals. 
And there has been a lot of work on interpretable and explainable AI over the last few years. But because of the sheer number of parameters in these models, it's very difficult to perform the types of sensitivity analyses that we're used to as scientists and engineers. So we hope to address these challenges, at least in part, with sparse dictionary learning. And if you follow this channel before in the past, you may be familiar with dictionary learning in the context of the sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics. And the idea is very simple. We start with some data and we set up a linear regression problem. So we have these outputs, uh, these labels, which are going to be describing the dynamics. Perhaps it is the, the next state or uh, the time derivatives, as we see here. Um, but the main uh, part of dictionary learning is that we have to assemble this big matrix of candidate library terms. Um, so these can be polynomials, sines, cosines, whatever makes sense for the problem that you're looking at. And we're going to evaluate these candidate functions on the data that we have. And the whole idea with the sparse dictionary learning is to sort of identify the minimal representation of this data, or, or of this model that des best describes the data. And we can do this with arbitrary regression problems. As long as we have some labels, we can assemble this dictionary and uh, pass our data through it. But the point here is that this is really fast. Uh, this is just linear regression. We've been doing this for decades. We have optimized software for all of this. And we're able to get a symbolic interpretable representation. Uh, because we have uh, sort of these uh, dictionary functions that we can go in and actually inspect. So how can we use this with reinforcement learning? Well, first, let's check out the environment. So what we really want to do is minimize the number of interactions with some full order model. But first, we do need some amount of data. Maybe someone's handed us data, but if not, we have to go collect it ourselves. In this example, I'm just going to take random actions that you can see here. But we collect the state, action, and next state pairs. And then we're going to fit an ensemble of dictionary models on top of this. We use an ensemble because we found this to be uh, very robust in the low data limit, and we're going to be working in that limit. Uh, but the point here is that we're going to get some dynamics model out of this, and we're going to train our agent to interact with that surrogate model. And this is going to bypass all the expensive interactions that might take place over here in the physical world or our high fidelity simulator. So we're going to train our policy uh, over and over and over again to be interacting here. And then we're going to deploy this back to that uh, full order environment. And by doing so, uh, we can see how well our agent performs. If we perform really well, we can stop. Right? There's no need to train anymore. Uh, but chances are we're not doing that great because our dynamics model is not that great. We only collected a little bit of data. But by evaluating our agent here, we have new data. So we can refine this uh, dynamics model and train again. And we can repeat this process over and over and over again and iteratively improve our control and our dynamics. Uh, this is a particular type of model-based reinforcement learning called DynaStyle model-based reinforcement learning. And often people use neural networks for this dynamics model. But by using a dictionary, we also end up with an interpretable representation. Uh, so if we didn't have any models before, uh, this can give us new insight into what's going on. But how does this do in practice? Uh, well, here's an example where we've just trained the agent uh, using that first dictionary dynamics model. And you can see the agent is performing so poorly, it doesn't even want to show its face on screen. It's so embarrassed. But we can go in and inspect this dynamics model. So this is the theta dot uh, theta plane in our face portrait. And if uh, we look at it, it looks very similar to the, the normal simple pendulum face portrait. It's actually done a remarkably good job given how little data there is. But if you inspect it closely, you'll see that this yellow star is slightly offset from an unstable equilibrium. And that's our goal state. Uh, so we haven't quite identified the right dynamics yet. And if we use this to train our agent forever, we'd always be steering it to the wrong spot. So we need to refit those dynamics. And when we do so, we start to do better. 
um, you'll see that in this middle agent is almost able to actually stabilize uh, the pole. And if we inspect the dynamics model, we've uh, corrected that offset. But by the 25th time that we've done this, uh, we have actually been able to solve the task and we have good dynamics. But we only interact with the environment 25, uh, for 25 trajectories. So we're being pretty sample efficient. And we can evaluate this explicitly. If we compare this to a, uh, a model base, or sorry, a model free policy optimizer called uh, PPO, uh, we see that it takes a significant amount of time to reach very good performance. But our method actually does this, what appears almost instantly. You have to really zoom in to see how well we're doing. And it turns out that we're about 100 times more sample efficient. So as we start to scale up to more complicated environments, uh, this can have a real tangible impact. And we can scale this to more complicated environments. Uh, this is the fluid flow past a cylinder. And in this task, uh, we're going to provide the agent with just a two-dimensional observation space. So this is an infinite dimensional system, right? It's governed by a partial differential equation. Um, but already, we're you know, having a very reduced uh, amount of sensing information. And it's entirely based off of the lift, which is the upward force that is exerted on the cylinder. Uh, so we're using the lift and its derivative. And we're going to be rotating the cylinder back and forth in an effort to reduce the, the amount of drag on it. But you'll notice that if we create a surrogate environment purely based off of these observations, we have no way of measuring that drag. So we have to modify our process a little bit. And that's where fitting the reward function comes in. Um, to modify this, uh, we don't have to do much. We just need to collect uh, information about that reward and simultaneously fit a, a, a dictionary model uh, alongside the dynamics um, for the reward. And we can't always do this, right? If you don't have the information, there's no way to actually fit it. But in cases where we have these high fidelity simulation environments, it, it may be possible. And this will allow us to bypass things like taking global integrals when we only have uh, partial information in our observation. So instead of having this picture, we're going to have a reward function or a drag that depends on the observation and the action here. And this is uh, an idea of the kinds of results that we can get. Uh, we don't fit the reward uh, exactly, but it's pretty well correlated. And we're able to inspect this reward and see how it responds to different uh, controls. And it sort of shifts this landscape very smoothly and nicely. Um, but importantly, we can actually look at the symbolic representation where we find that we can discard all the linear terms and only pay attention to these quadratic terms and this mean offset term, which is about 1.5. And again, the, the same story holds. Uh, with this approach, we can greatly reduce the number of interactions with an environment and save a ton of time because these are very expensive simulations. So I've talked a lot about how we can uh, use these methods to accelerate the deep reinforcement learning process. But now, what do we do if we have this deep neural network? It's still this black box. Well, the deep neural network is just a function. We can evaluate it anywhere. Um, so we can pass in um, you know, any sets of observations and get outputs here, for example, with a swing up environment. But now we can just collect data. And if we do this in an intelligent way, we can actually fit a dictionary approximation that looks very similar um, to that neural network. But the difference here is that uh, we're only going to end up with 55 parameters. So here is uh, sort of the performance of the neural network and the dictionary policy on different uh, initial conditions. The performance is very similar. Uh, but we have orders of magnitude fewer parameters, and this is just represented by a, a polynomial in this case. And in control theory, we love working with polynomials. We've been doing this for decades. So now we can start to use all the classical analyses that we have for stability and robustness guarantees. 
And again, regardless of which of these approaches we use, we can actually quantify the uncertainty. Um, so imagine, for example, that we have a scalar-valued dictionary model. Now, there are likely many different um, coefficients that describe our data pretty well, right? There's some distribution of like, um, likely coefficients. So we can treat these coefficients as random variables and start to ask ourselves, you know, how sensitive is our model? Uh, what is the variance of our function at a given point uh, with respect to all of these likely coefficients? And it turns out that there's this beautiful formula for computing that. And if we scale up to vector value dictionary functions, the story is exactly the same. The only difference now is that we're taking a sum over these different covariance matrices. And now you can see why fitting these ensembles of dictionary models is useful here, because now we can start to empirically quantify these covariance matrices and thus quantify the variance and uncertainty in our models. So for instance, if we take this uh, swing up environment that we had before, we can look at the dynamics uh, model that we have. And at the very beginning of training, uh, we haven't seen that much data uh, for a variety of angles, right? We're just restricted to random actions that are um, getting us very small angles. And because of that, we have a very low variance uh, in, for the small angle um, regime. But outside of that uh, little, little spot, uh, the variance increases by orders of magnitude. But as we train our agent and we update our dynamics, uh, this variance landscape changes in, over time too. And by the time that we've actually been able to solve this task, we see that our trajectories live in this low variance basin. So this gives us an idea as to where we can actually trust our dynamics and trust the control that we're exerting. And we can do this for more complicated environments too, uh, both for the dynamics and the reward. Uh, so the, again, this is our cylinder agent, and we can see how this landscape changes in response to the control that we're uh, inputting into the environment. And we see that our agent is essentially pushing us into these low variance basins. As soon as the, we start to exit the basin, our agent is going to input a control to push us into another one. So how does this help us? Well, I neglected from the very beginning to describe, you know, when do we actually evaluate our agent, right? You can train this for an infinite number of samples, um, but we're going to start overfitting uh, to our bad dynamics model. But if we use this uncertainty quantification, we now have a way of determining when uh, the agent has started to enter dynamics regions that we shouldn't trust. And if we start to consistently do that, then perhaps maybe it's time to go back and evaluate our model and see if we can actually trust uh, the data that we're getting from these places. And we don't go into details about this in the paper, um, but I do want to highlight that if we have this uncertainty, then we can actually exploit that for different tasks too. In fact, we can create different objective functions uh, for the control. For example, if this dark red region is a place of low variance, we might want to steer our system into high variance regions in order to collect new data and refine our models, whether it's the dynamics, the reward, or the policy. Um, that way we can start to um, you know, get better representations and uh, do better in the long run for other objectives. But steering your system into the unknown is kind of a dangerous thing to do. So we might also think about uh, you know, sticking to regions that we can trust. So we have some goal, we start at point A, we want to get at point B, and we want to minimize uh, the, you know, the cost of getting from point A to point B um, while minimizing the variance uh, as well. So we can stay in these trusted regions. And finally, you can think of this idea of curiosity-driven control 
um, which is kind of a hybrid. We want to get from point A to point B, but we can be a little risky and you know, move down into these high variance regions just a little bit. So by using the uncertainty, we can not only inspect these models, but also improve them or exploit them uh, for purposes of trust. So just as a recap, we started with dictionary learning and we showed how we can use it to create these interpretable representations of these three major building blocks. Uh, we can use a surrogate uh, environment and reward function to accelerate training, um, perhaps by two orders of magnitude, and greatly reduce the cost of interacting with an ex uh, expensive environment. We can also distill an interpretable representation of an agent and um, use that for trusted control and all the classical kinds of analyses that we like to perform. And finally, we can do uncertainty quantification on any of these methods, uh, whether it's uh, in isolation or together. And we can use that to, uh, as a tool to identify these um, you know, different data gaps and inspect these learned models, but also perhaps for future work, we can actually use this uh, as new objectives for um, control. So thank you so much for watching. Uh, again, if you're interested in learning more about this work, we have a paper on the archive, and all of our code can be found at this GitHub. Until next time.